Good morning. Uh, committee will come to order. Um, thank you all for being here, particularly uh, Administrator Werta for being here, and the uh, Kogan family members, uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, on September 30th of this year, the current Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization expires. This current authorization occurred after five years of short-term extensions and a partial shutdown, which resulted in tremendous instability and uncertainty for the agency, industry, stakeholders, and the flying public. Uh, Chairman Schuster and I have repeatedly talked about this and pledged to do our very best, along with Mr. DeFazio and Mr. Larson, uh, to see that this will not happen again. Uh, as we draft the new authorization, there are several key areas that must be addressed. Technological advances since the last bill are at the heart of two key areas of focus. The move toward GBS-based uh, air traffic control under NextGen and the growth of commercial interest in unmanned aerial system. These technologies hold enormous potential that could improve the efficiency and safety of our airspace system while unlocking billions of dollars in economic activity for the country. As Minister Huerta will concur, NextGen utilizes many technologies that would not only increase capacity, but also improve the safety of our airspace. Many of these technologies were researched, developed, and tested at the FAA Technical Center, the premier research and development facility for the FAA, which is in my district. Uh, while progress has been made on establishing next-gen foundational programs, it's clear that the FAA has a great deal of work to do before passengers and operators begin to realize more significant benefits. For the past year, we've received an extensive amount of input from stakeholders regarding the slow pace of FAA implementation of next-gen as well as the agency's inefficient and overly burdensome certification process, processes which we think is uh, impacting in a negative way on the economics of the country. Many of these problems have been identified in several oversight hearings conducted by the subcommittee, as well as by DOT Inspector General and Government Account Accountability Office. In addition, uh, we've raised them directly with Secretary Fox and Administrator Huerta, and I would again convey that Congress as a whole is closely monitoring the FAA's progress on next-gen and the subcommittee will continue its vigorous oversight in light of recent reports from the DOT Inspector General on cost overruns and delays. Furthermore, after months of delay, the FAA finally released its proposed rule on the integration of small unmanned aerial systems, or UAS, into the national airspace. But the estimate timeline of 2017 for finalization of the rule, uh, I think, just seems too long. Other countries are moving ahead more quickly than us as we speak, and the American leadership simply cannot be taken for granted and or allowed to slip. I urge the FAA to act both quickly and carefully to ensure the United States leads the world in safe UAS integration. Having the resources of the FAA Technical Center and the six UAS test sites at its disposal, I believe the agency can achieve uh, this important goal, and Mr. Larson and I um, stand with the committee ready to work with Administrator Werta with you on this and on other issues. As we move forward with FAA Authorization Act, we must ensure that our efforts to address these longstanding problems do not adversely impact safety, which has and will continue to be a top priority of the committee. On that note, I'd like to hear from uh, Administrator on the FAA's efforts to implement one of the last outstanding requirements of the Airline Safety Act of 2010, the establishment of pilot records database. On a final note, we are now well into the 21st century. However, many of our systems and regulatory platforms are for 20th century world. Now it's time for Congress, stakeholders, and the community to work together to do something big to ensure that our leadership in aviation is maintained. Uh, before I recognize my colleague, Mr. Larson, for his comments, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material for the record of this hearing. Uh, without objection, so ordered. And uh, now I'd like to yield to Mr. Larson for any opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an uh, opening statement uh, that I will just summarize, given the interest of uh, time and the interest of the members here. Um, today for the hearing. Uh, I want to just em uh, emphasize a few things in, in my opening statement. Uh, first off is safety, that as we do the uh, FAA reauthorization, uh, safety must be uh, first thing on our mind. Uh, the second is uh, investment, and we need to find a way to work with FAA to ensure stable and adequate funding 
to mitigate impacts of sequestration and other constraints on the agency. Uh, third is NextGen. Although there have been problems with implementation uh, with your leadership, Mr. Chairman, um, and working with the RTCA NextGen Advisory Committee, uh, we have um, uh, been able to en ensure a development of uh, four key recommendations. That funding has been in the 2015 budget for those recommendations, and we need to start looking at what the next steps are for NextGen reauthorization. Uh, third, uh, fourth is uh, certification, as you mentioned, the, the consistent uh, regulatory environment for uh, consistent certification approvals for components and platforms is critical. And the, uh, finally, the um, uh, integration of UAS in the commercial airspace. These are some of the issues that I know we'll be dealing with, uh, but with that, I'd ask unanimous consent for my full uh, statement to put in the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Larson. With that, I yield back. Uh, Chairman Schuster. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Lobiano, for holding this hearing, and Administrator Huerta, thank you for being here today. Um, I'll be brief also, because uh, I know the members have questions and we've shortened time here today. Uh, but I uh, appreciate you being here today, and I, I think my two colleagues have laid out all the issues that we all want to solve. Um, I hope uh, that we can c continue to be talking and, and to start a, a, maybe a more intense debate about how we do significant reform. You and I have had these conversations um, where we look around the world today and the air traffic control organizations uh, literally across the world are being pulled out of government and functioning more uh, in, in a, in a, in a, as a business, and uh, they're maintaining safety. Uh, they're uh, eliminating the, uh, uh, well, they run more effectively, efficiently. They run, or they're eliminating the political process. As you know, we've seen the 23 extensions, the, the sequestration, the government shutdown, the political infighting goes on. When you take it out of government, then they can operate and make decisions. They can make those investments long term without Congress is part of the problem. Uh, so again, uh, I look forward to, uh, to having those discussions, and I, I'll ask my question right now, so maybe somewhere in the process, uh, you know, are you open to let's talking about a, ser a serious, significant reform uh, to the FAA to move uh, the, the organization more to the way the rest of the world is doing it? So I look forward to, to, to hearing your testimony and questions today. So thanks for being here. Yield back. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman Schuster. Mr. DeFazio. I uh, thank Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'll put uh, my remarks regarding uh, the uh, reauthorization uh, in the record. I share many of the concerns and objectives that have been raised, uh, but I want to raise something else uh, because I'm I'm quite uh, concerned. Uh, you know, GAO uh, released a report uh, yesterday. I was one of the uh, co-requesters uh, of that report. Uh, which pointed out uh, significant problems uh, with the FAA in terms of uh, cyber security. And I, I don't think I've ever seen a GAO report before that had uh, 168 corrective actions and 17 uh, general uh, recommendations. And I've got to say that I'm very, very concerned. To me, it's a nightmare scenario. I've spent a number of years on Homeland Security. We know there is an enduring interest in terrorist groups in aviation. They've used our aviation system as weapons. Uh, one can imagine, uh, you know, they might be interested in hacking the system uh, and perhaps could facilitate uh, a mid-air collision. Uh, so I, I'm very, very gravely concerned about this, and uh, I hope that the administrator can briefly address uh, what he uh, intends to do uh, to and how quickly we can move to secure the system. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, today, we are very pleased to welcome the Honorable Michael Warta, Administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, thank you for being here. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Schuster, Ranking Member DeFazio, Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to speak about reauthorization of the FAA. It seems like not that long ago that we were united behind the FAA reauthorization of 2012 with a sense of urgency to provide long-term funding to support our nation's aviation system. And now we're here to continue that work. We have a joint responsibility government and industry to pull together to create the air traffic system that will carry this nation well into the 21st century. In the last five years, the FAA has made major progress in transforming our airspace system through NextGen, and that progress continues as we speak. The FAA has delivered on its commitment to build the foundation that will support the many applications of NextGen. 
In 2014, we completed the coast-to-coast -coast installation of a network of radio transceivers that will enable a satellite-based air traffic control system that provides a more precise and efficient alternative to radar. With this foundation now in place, we're working with the airline industry and the general aviation community to help them to do their part to meet the requirement to equip by the 2020 deadline. By the end of this month, we will finish the upgrade of our en route tra air traffic control automation system. This system will accommodate the new technologies of NextGen. This is one of the largest automation changeovers in the history of the FAA, and it results in a more powerful air traffic system that can handle the challenges of the coming decades. Through our collaboration with industry, last year we identified and agreed on key priorities in implementing NextGen, and we have been following through. We now have more satellite-based procedures in our skies than radar-based procedures. We have created new NextGen routes in cities across America that are saving millions of dollars in fuel burn, shortening flight paths, decreasing carbon emissions, and cutting down on delays. All of this means that airline schedules are more predictable and travelers face fewer delays. The United States stands as a leader in aviation internationally, and we intend to remain the gold standard. Our manufacturers produce innovative aircraft and avionics that help maintain our nation's positive balance of trade. We're truly unique in that we have the most diverse aviation community, which includes new users like unmanned aircraft and commercial space vehicles. Civil aviation contributes 12 million jobs and $1.5 trillion to our national economy. America's leadership in aviation is being challenged on a global level, however, with the growth of foreign competitors and the shifting dynamics of supply chains. Domestically, the FAA faces challenges I think we can all acknowledge. We have competing priorities among our stakeholders, one of the byproducts of a healthy and diverse system. And we have had to navigate a constrained fiscal environment in recent years with new, nearly two dozen short-term extensions prior to the 2012 reauthorization. The FAA needs to prioritize its resources to leverage new technology and to respond nimbly to evolving challenges. To maintain our global leadership and to continue to reap the economic benefits of this industry, we should use the upcoming reauthorization to provide the FAA with the tools necessary to meet the pressing demands of the future. A lot is at stake, and we need to get this right. To that end, the administration has developed a set of principles that we believe will improve our nation's airspace system and set the course for future progress. First, we need to maintain our excellent safety record and foster the use of data and the use of analysis to focus our pre pre precious resources on the areas of highest risk in our aviation system. We must continue the modernization of our air traffic control system. Part of that effort is to ensure stable funding for core operations and next-gen investments. And collaboration with industry is absolutely essential. We need to deliver benefits, and the industry needs to equip to use these improvements. FAA reauthorization should secure appropriate funding for our nation's airports. It should also enable the integration of new users into our airspace system and support the agency in fostering a culture of innovation and efficiency. The FAA also needs to realign today's airspace system with current demands. We need the flexibility to make investment choices that further the health of our airspace system so that everyone can benefit. And finally, we need to maintain our position of aviation leadership on the world stage. This means the FAA needs to remain at the table to shape and harmonize international aviation standards and promote seamless travel around the world. We're extremely proud of America's aviation heritage and innovation and inspiration that our strong and diverse system has always provided. I look forward to working together to make sure that the United States continues to lead the world as we create the right conditions for further innovation and achievement in the second century of flight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Werder. Um, on the topic of next gen, um, we have spent a lot of time, and uh, I know there are uh, tangible and now some measurable results, uh, but they're still in the minds of many members and certainly for a lot of the stakeholders, a serious disconnect um, between what the government auditors are saying 
and what the FAA is saying. And I'm hoping you can shed some light and explain why there is such a disconnect where we have the FAA stating that NextGen is on time and delivering the benefits expected and government auditors, which we heard from as recently as last week, um, talking about uh, little benefits and slow implementation. And we're not talking about from 10 years ago. We're talking about this report we got last week was like in the last couple of years. Could you help us understand this? Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. NextGen is a very complex undertaking, and it requires the deployment of core foundational technology um, upon which we build applications that the users are able to take advantage of. Both of those activities need to continue in tandem. We, the agency has been very focused on delivering the core infrastructure programs, such as the ADSB program that I referenced in my, uh, in my opening statement, as well as the Enroute automation platform. At the same time, however, and those programs have, uh, the ADSB program was delivered on time and on budget. The ERAM program was delayed, but we are coming to the conclusion of that. And uh, those create an important foundation. At the same time, however, the FAA has taken the step to work with the stakeholders, the airline uh, industry and the general aviation community to deliver specific benefits and to deliver them now. The focus of that has been on performance-based navigation, where we have developed a number of programs in metropolitan areas to redesign airspace to result in very efficient flight paths that uh, reduce fuel burn and therefore reduce cost to the industry. Last year, there were two very significant developments uh, with the uh, redesign of the airspace around Houston, where we deployed 61 new air traffic procedures on a single day followed by North Texas, where we delivered 81 new efficient procedures on a single day. We've also done airspace redesign projects here in Washington, D.C., and in Northern California, and in Seattle, and other metropolitan areas are following. These metropolitan-focused benefit programs yield very, very significant fuel savings. Longer term, now with the foundational infrastructure in place, we can focus on the national benefit programs, programs such as Datacom uh, that we have been doing trials on and which we expect to complete in 2019. And so it is true that it is a project that has taken many years, but we are delivering benefits for users and we are delivering them now, and that pace will continue in the years ahead. Um, on the issue of um, safe integration of unmanned aircraft systems, uh, of course, it's of great interest to many people across the country, as you know. Um, how does the FAA plan to utilize the test sites while it works through the small UAS rulemaking? The test sites play a critical role in serving as the focal point for data and analysis and research in the areas of unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, the, uh, as a result of research that is taking place at uh, the FAA's Tech Center in Atlantic City, a lot of good research is being done on critical technologies that are essential for safe integration of unmanned aircraft. These include technologies such as detect and avoid, how do aircraft sense other aircraft, which is critical to uh, ensuring that they can be safely integrated. Likewise, they ser it serves as the repository to share research data among the six test sites so that the research done in one test site can be broadly understood and can be used to illuminate research in all the other test sites as well. The Tech Center plays a critical role. Um, thank you. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Mr. Huerta, you outlined in your testimony, your oral testimony you written, some of the uh, advances we've made in next-gen implementation. So I have two questions on that. Um, despite that um, outline, there's still concerns, not just from the industry, um, from airlines, but from other folks that uh, nothing's being done, we're still way behind, uh, mm -hmm. all sorts of criticisms along those lines. Can you uh, briefly address that? The, the key development that we've been able to make with NextGen have really brought the, the system a long way in realizing those benefits. 
I understand the skepticism that the industry and others in the system have had over many years, but I would encourage everyone to look at the very significant challenge we've made in the last five years. As we, as we have built out the foundational technologies and as we have been very, very focused on delivery of benefits. Under the direction and with the support of this committee, we have engaged actively with industry. And part of the, and the key part of doing that was to ensure that what we were focused on was delivering the priorities that industry want. As you know, uh, we reached agreement with industry on key four, uh, on four key areas of priority that they want us to focus on in the near term for the delivery of benefit. That was done through a collaborative process. We reached agreement on those priorities, and we are tracking to the milestones uh, that were set forth in those priorities. They include a significant increase of and focus on performance-based navigation, which we're doing through our Metroplex program. They want us to focus on surface operations, which we're very, very committed to. A significant focus on data comp, where we are uh, focusing on uh, deploying uh, right now, the program is running in trials in two airports, and we will be deploying in two more in the months ahead. So uh, by working in collaboration with industry, we have identified their priorities. We're very focused on continuing to deliver in those areas. Okay. I know, uh, and Chairman and I sort of feel like ex officio members of the, uh, of the NAC at times uh, when it comes to next gen. Um, so I know there's, uh, on UAS, there's a significant backlog of Section 333 exemption requests, and what can we do to help make this process more streamlined? Uh, I know we've talked about um, approaching it from a programmatic uh, approach rather than a one-off exemption approach uh, without compromising safety. Uh, what's, do, do, can you provide an opinion of, of this programmatic approach that uh, some of us have talked about? Absolutely. Under Section 333 of the reauthorization of 2012, Congress granted us the authority to grant exemptions for, to integrate particular users of unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. And that has proven to be a very popular tool. We have a very large number of applications that have been received from industry. About 450 or so? Yeah. The challenge that we have is that exemptions are granted to an individual or a company for a specific purpose. The agency has very limited ability to grant blanket exemptions to whole classes of users. And so what that means is that we have to evaluate each application on its own individual merits and the criteria around uh, its own um, it, the specifics of what they're talking about. Would the agency argue that that's what the language of 333 says it has to do? I, it, it has to do with the nature of an exemption, which is what 333 authorized was the ability to grant an exemption. An exemption is to an individual for a specific purpose. And so it's the relationship of the two things. Anything that we can do that would enable us to look at classes of operators that have substantially identical facts or uh, very similar characteristics I think could be quite helpful. Nonetheless, in the near term, we are, look, we are looking at what we can do to continue to streamline the process of granting the exemptions as uh, we are currently doing them. All right. Uh, that's fine. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Schuster. Uh, thank you. Um, again, welcome. Mr. Iwerda, um, and I, I laid out for you in my opening statement, uh, you know, the problems we've seen with the, the sequestration, the 23 extensions, um, the problems that DOT inspectors, the, the GAO report that uh, Mr. DeFazio pointed out. Um, and again, my question is about, uh, is the time ripe for us to be engaged in a debate to do significant reform? One of the things I learned uh, the last week or so was uh, that Verizon, which does a lot of the same kind of things you manage, manage data, signals, moving things around. Um, they've replaced their system four times in the last 10 years. Um, and if they did, it, they'd still be on the 1G program instead of the 4, 4G program. They, they've been able to do that four times replacement in 10 years. And, and we've been talking about next gen for 25 years. Um, and, and again, I there's blame at Congress too because of the way we've, we've operated, you know, 23 extensions, government shutdowns, th those things aren't helpful either. Uh, but I, I think it's time for us to, again, look around the world and 
see that they've taken and moved the air traffic control organization out of government, let the FAA do what they're supposed to do, and that's regulate, uh, make sure we get more certainty in the certification program. So again, my question to you, is the time right for us to really be sitting down talking about uh, a significant restructuring uh, with governance and the financing system of the FAA? Mr. Chairman, uh, there are three things that I think any structure needs to yield for the FAA as a whole. The first, and most importantly, we will agree on, is that we have to maintain the safety of the system. The second is that we have to have an expeditious and orderly way to deploy technology and to make it operational. And the third is to recognize the tight relationship that exists between developing new operational procedures and certifying them for safe use within the system. The Secretary and I are both very open to, um, any, uh, to a discussion on structures that would enable us to achieve that. But I would stress that what we have to ensure is that there are not unintended consequences that could actually set back the significant progress uh, that we are making. The other point that I would like to make is that the technology systems that the FAA is responsible for are fundamentally different in many ways from telecommunications and other technology systems in this respect. Their principal purpose is to ensure that a system is safe. And what that means is it, require, it, it, it imposes, and I think correctly, a very high threshold on the performance of those systems as well as mitigations and backups to ensure that they don't in any way compromise safety. Clearly, we are all focused on how we can do that as efficiently as possible, and uh, we're open to a discussion about how best to do that. Right, and, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's got to be safety, 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 and uh, you also have an industry. You know, Boeing, Boeing wants their planes to fly forever, and so they're, they're, they're fixated on safety, which they should be. Um, but, I, but would you agree that there are examples around the world that are doing things very differently than we are, and they've still maintained that high level of safety uh, in, in their operations? There are examples around the world of very different models, but uh, it is also important to recognize that we have a significantly different aviation system than any other part of the world. Just in size alone, is that the? In size alone, but also in composition and mix. There is no one that has the robust and uh, highly diverse general aviation industry that we have. There is no one that has the mix of metropolitan and rural areas that we have and the mix of airspace and the challenges associated with management that go with that. There is no one that has the diversity of users that we have, and particularly the new ones, such as uh, the development of commercial space and the development of unmanned aircraft systems. There is, uh, what we have to come up with is an operational model that works for the United States, not for other countries. And I think that what will come out of that, uh, recognizing a uniquely American set of circumstances that we have, is to come up with uniquely American solutions to address those. Sure. And I agree with that. And that, but making those points drives me to believe that next gen, the technology, is absolutely essential. And we've been talking about it and talking about it. And finally, the time comes, we have to do it. And that's why I believe so firmly that we've got to do something different. Again, to not only because of things not going right at FAA, but because of Congress's starts and stops when it comes to funding and regular and the things that we do up here. So, so again, I appreciate your openness to, uh, to, to talk about this and to debate this and look forward to working with you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, I directed a question at the beginning or concerns about the GAO report. You want to tell me uh, your reaction, what you're going to do, how quickly you can deal with this? Sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. DeFazio. First and foremost, the system is safe. GAO acknowledged in their report that uh, the agency has made significant progress in identifying the issues that they talked about. And of the many recommendations, many have already been mitigated and we're working closely with them to continue to focus on them. I'm very actively focused on the recommendations and uh, as I mentioned, we've remediated a very significant number of the technical findings already. We established a cybersecurity steering committee a number of years ago. This was part of an initiative to give greater focus to the whole question of cyber. 
And uh, I've asked them to provide oversight uh, to, on behalf of the agency uh, on a risk-based approach as we address each of these recommendations. They're not all equal. We've been proactively in identifying other potential actions to enhance the cybersecurity posture of our national airspace system, as well as uh, the agency as a whole. And we've been working with our other government partners, those that, uh, like we, have technology-based organizations to ensure that we're using best practices. It's something that I am very committed to and very concerned about, and we're remediating this as quickly as we can. You're moving, or intending to move a lot to the cloud. Doesn't that raise concerns? It raises um, an important question. Uh, as we have transitioned our national airspace system from what's largely been a closed system to an IP-based system where we're buying services from the private sector, what it means is not so much that we're opening up a problem that we haven't had, but it means that we have to ensure that we're using private sector best practices to ensure that we have the appropriate cyber controls in place. Okay. Well, I haven't had a chance to read the 168 SSI uh, recommendations, but I've got to say I'm, I, I'm going to be looking for some very specific assurances when I find some critical deficiencies because, uh, you know, a, a hack of the air traffic control system could lead to catastrophic consequences, in my opinion. So, uh, quickly on a couple other issues, uh, I started uh, maybe 15 years ago raising concerns about uh, foreign repair stations with more and more work moving there. I have concerns, you know, that these people don't undergo background checks, uh, but also at least minimally drug and alcohol testing. We've been working on a rule for I don't know how long. Where are we at? Uh, we did publish an advance notice of proposed rulemaking um, on drug testing and foreign repair stations. We re received a number of comments. We're evaluating those now, and uh, we want to get the notice out uh, in, in the near future. It has, has been about, I think, a decade. Um, then uh, how about the centralized database for pilot records? Where are we at on that? We've uh, done a, a fair amount of work on a centralized database. One of the things that we wanted to see is what we could learn from other industries that focus on centralized uh, records from a wide variety of different technology sources. This one is technically very difficult for us to uh, work through and to do it in a way that we can ensure that it meets the appropriate cost-benefit uh, 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 hurdles that it needs to meet. But um, it's something uh, that is within the agency, and I'm hopeful that we're going to have a resolution of it uh, in the not-too-distant future. Okay. And then uh, we've had uh, you know talk, a lot of talk about certification. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned about the, uh, you know, whether or not you're able to uh, have adequate oversight with the proliferation of the ODAs out there. I mean, uh, are you concerned about those staffing levels? Are you looking at augmenting those staffing levels? My understanding is, you know, these inspectors are carrying massive workloads and, and, and they're going to get around like once every three years maybe to look at something. The challenge is to come up with the appropriate balance of how do we use data to determine the highest areas of risk and to focus our efforts on that. Even if the FAA had all the resources in the world, uh, aviation by its very nature is all about innovative technology, and we have to ensure that we get the expertise uh, uh, from the people that have it. Sometimes that will be from the industry, and the designation process is intended to find that right balance between what the agency retains and what we rely on industry to, uh, to do on our behalf. So you think it's optimal at this point then? I don't think it's optimal because the industry is always evolving. I know that we have to be more nimble in how we uh, do our part of it. Likewise, we have to have appropriate tools that enable us to audit industry acting on our behalf to ensure that uh, there are not problems in the system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeFazio. Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for expressing uh, our continuing concern about the cost overruns on uh, the next-gen contracts and so forth. But, uh, Mr. Administrator, I have two other concerns. Uh, uh, first of all, there's a lot of, uh, there's great interest in and even great concern about uh, unmanned aircraft drones. Uh, and uh, the uh, DOT uh, Inspector General uh, several months ago issued a report in, 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 about uh, 
the FAA being behind schedule and, and there being what they called a magnitude of uh, safety and privacy concerns about uh, drones and people uh, we're reading that Amazon and a lot of other big companies want to do potentially millions of deliveries by drones. People are wondering about uh, are they going to walk through their neighborhood and have to dodge these vehicles uh, are in privacy concerns and so forth. Where do you see all that heading and can we, can we put some kind of, uh, are we going to be able to put limitations or control on uh, some of these uh, unmanned vehicles? Uh, Mr. Duncan, I think you very well summarized the three competing things that need to be balanced as we integrate unmanned aircraft. On the one hand, there are the innovators that want to take advantage of the technology to do as much as they can. On the other, uh, the public has expressed concerns about how are they safely integrated. And uh, there are also concerns that have been expressed about ensuring that individuals' rights to privacy are protected. The FAA is extremely concerned and very focused on how we balance the, the first two of these. How can we uh, provide for integration, but how do we ensure that it is done safely? The small UAS rule that we put out earlier this year uh, strikes a balance between uh, dividing the industry into different classes of unmanned aircraft, very small where there might be less risk, um, and then larger where we would suggest that uh, there would be different uh, requirements that would be created for that. We have proposed to uh, create a different class of operator, not a pilot's license, but an unmanned aircraft operator. And uh, for certain classes, we propose that they be exempt from the certification requirement. But they still need to meet appropriate standards of safety. On the same day that we announced our rule, the White House uh, put out a policy related to privacy. And I think that reflects the larger concern that we as a government need to be concerned about. And that is, how do we ensure the appropriate levels of protection for personal privacy? The government's policy deals with the government's own use of unmanned aircraft, but the president also tasked the Commerce Department through the NTIA to really take the lead in looking at these larger questions of privacy and how do we ensure that individuals' privacy is protected. We're going to need to balance all of these things as we integrate unmanned aircraft into the airspace system and as we do it safely. Well, thank you. There's other. Uh aspects to that, but I don't have time to get into all of that. I, with, I, I do want to raise my other topic that I've always had so much concern about. In the late 90s, the Atlanta airport testified uh, before us that uh, uh, their main longest runway took 14 years from conception to completion. It took only 99 construction days. And in, in every aspect or every part of the work that this committee does, uh, it, uh, highway projects, uh, the rail bill that we'll have in there today, we're, we've tried to put in environmental streamlining. Sometimes over the years it seems that we've been more successful at lip service than we have about actual action in speeding things up. And, and we seem to take about three times as long as other developed nations on almost all these major transportation projects. Are you satisfied that we're, that we're doing everything that needs to be done? Uh, on speeding up project delivery times and in and, and environmental streamlining to get so we can get this thing these things done in cost effective ways the committee gave us some important tools in our last authorization in 2012 for the congress um, those are dealing with uh, the environmental process as it relates to airspace redesign which is critical for us to deliver performance-based navigation and next gen uh, there were two categorical exclusion categories where uh, Congress directed us that under certain criteria that uh, we could make a finding of a categorical exclusion, which greatly uh, accelerates the, um, the environmental process. Two categories of those. The first one we adopted as policy. The second we worked with the Next Gen Advisory Committee to come up with a way forward of how we implement that. And so this is something that we're very focused on. I will say that um, in your home airport in Atlanta, one of the things that we've been focused on in the airspace redesign is how can we get more capacity out of the runways that they've already built. And as a result of that activity, we've been able to get a significant increase in both the arrival and departure capacity as a result of doing airspace changes and relying on this streamlined process that we're talking about. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
few questions uh, that I have. First, you know, I'll start out with, um, with this one. Uh, Lewis University Airport is located in uh, Will County, which is an important part of uh, my district, one of the fastest growing regions in northeastern Illinois. Uh, Lewis University Airport submitted a list of capital needs to the Illinois Department of Transportation, which the administers the FAA State Block Grant Program. A few of the priorities include land acquisition for runway safety, a runway rehabilitation project, and most importantly, a control tower, which is critical to support the airport's role as a uh, generator of regional economic growth, a uh, important reliever airport for Midway and O'Hare International Airports, and also a uh, training school. So I appreciate uh, the meeting that uh, we, were, we are going to have next month to discuss uh, these important needs. I look forward to that meeting and in, in discussing uh, what uh, potential ways there is for the FAA uh, to, to fund these projects, especially the control towers. That sort of leads me to a more general question. I'm wondering if you can provide any updates on the remote tower initiative that's ongoing. Uh, thank you. Uh, the FAA has started a program and is conducting research on what technology enables us to, uh, to do in terms of using a remote tower capability. Essentially what this is, is it's a combination of sensors, cameras, and other technology that creates, if you will, a virtual tower. The controllers that are actually removed from the facility in question have the ability to, uh, to operate it as if it is a tower that is located on the field. This is technology uh, that has been deployed in some very remote uh, regions of the far northern parts of Europe, and we've been focused on uh, working with that. We do have a program that we're doing in conjunction with the Commonwealth of Virginia to actually test this here at Leesburg Airport. And this is a project uh, that we're working cooperatively uh, with our labor partners as well as the airport in order to test this and understand how it works, uh, not only for Leesburg, but how it works in conjunction with the congested airspace uh, surrounding the Washington airports. And so the interaction between uh, what we're doing in, um, in this particular airport, I think will be very useful. If the results are promising, this is something that I want to move out very aggressively on because it holds great potential to address uh, the needs that you're discussing. In any sense of when that might be, you may have results that you're confident in? Uh, it kind of depends on what, where this takes us. The program is really just getting started at Leesburg right now. It, we have to develop some data in terms of uh, how it operates in different kinds of weather, different traffic conditions. But uh, we can provide detailed information on that to your office on a regular basis uh, so that we can give you a sense of what we're learning from that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lewis University is one of the 36 air traffic collegiate training initiative schools. And students from my district and across the nation uh, chose to attend Lewis because of the advantages that CTA, CTI schools provide. We all know that the hiring process has changed just over a year ago. Uh, and this really hurts uh, the students who decide at a young age to enroll in a program fostered by the FAA. I understand that a graduate of CTI school was never guaranteed a job, but they did have an advantage in the hiring process that they gained in exchange for working hard in school while paying tuition. I think the unique nature of these degrees is also worth noting. While a CTI graduate with a specialized degree can always pursue a different career path, the window to become an air traffic controller closes shut at age 31 and there's no going back. I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to know what the FAA is planning to do this year to build off the language of HR 83 to help students who enrolled or graduated after the hiring changes. Now, I understand the uh, purposes of the hiring changes, but uh, I'm concerned uh, about uh, the students who have uh, put all the time and effort and money into, a, into the CTI programs. Sure. We are implementing the provisions of the piece of legislation that you mentioned in this year's hiring program, and we have identified all the individuals that are affected by that um, going forward. I'd like to uh, step back and talk about uh, the broader point that you make about the benefit of the education program that goes there, as well as the point about uh, there being no guarantee. This is a highly competitive job. We received 28,000 applicants for 1,600 positions, and so under any scenario, uh, there will be a lot of people that would like the job that don't get it. 
But of those that we selected, two-thirds were CTI graduates, which I think indicates the value of the CTI education and how it positions people to compete for this highly competitive profession. Thank you. My time, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Rikita. I thank the chair. Good morning, Administrator. Good to be with you. And could you keep your microphone really close to your uh, mouth? Maybe that would help. Okay. Speak. Sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, been listening to your testimony, and some uh, things have, some phrases have popped out. Let me reiterate them. And, and I apologize for the paraphrase. Feel free to push back if I went un unfair in the paraphrasing. But you've testified so far that we need to keep our leadership position in aviation on the world stage. Uh, you said no one else in the world has a G GA industry as robust as ours. That's fair. And then you said we need to come up with uniquely American solutions because we have uh, an airspace system and, and a population of different stakeholders and users that's, that is unique. Fair? Fair. I agree with all that as well. Mm -hmm. My question is, it, it's, it's clear to me you're not a short order cook, okay? It's clear to me the agency's not a short order cook, and nor should we be when it comes to reg promulgating regulations. We, I believe in the old adage, you know, measure twice, cut once. But how long do you think it should take to come up with these Ameri you know, uniquely American solutions uh, in terms of promulgating regulations? Take the Pilot Protection Act, um, that uh, legislation that would uh, repeal the third class medical re requirement generally. Um, we've talked about that. You've written rules apparently, but we haven't seen them. Mm -hmm. you, you said I'd like the rules and, uh, and perhaps the 180 of us as co-sponsors would like the rules, perhaps love the rules. Maybe I'll use the word love. Maybe you said like. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting to like. I'm waiting to love. Uh, are you satisfied with how long it's taking for either these rules or how long it took for the uh, UAS rules to come out or the fact that the uh, Part 23 rewrite has gone way beyond the time. And I'm not trying to give you a gotcha question. I just, as, as a fellow leader and as a person who used to run a big agency himself, you know, how do you keep the accountability train moving? How do you measure metrics? How do you measure progress in these situations? The regulatory process, as you know, is quite deliberate. It can be quite frustrating. It's intended to balance and to deliberate over many, many competing objectives that are out there. On the point of the third class medical, you are correct. The agency has done a lot of work in this area, and uh, we've been in a discussion with our, administrative, our administration partners on what is the best way to proceed going forward and how we could implement this and make it uh, available for comment. I think that uh, the process certainly takes longer than I would like. It is something that I understand, though, because there are many competing points of view on this and in any other regulatory matter. But it has, these haven't even gotten out to the public. And that's not just about GAP. It's about the Part 23 rewrite. It's about the UAS just, that just hit the street, those regulations. I mean, yes or no, satisfied? I think that uh, I would like to see a quicker process, but I understand uh, that there are a lot of competing issue, interests that need to be resolved. Thank you. In that same vein, when do you anticipate implementing the Aviation Rulemaking Committee recommendations for Section 312 and 313 of the last reauthorization that had to do with the aircraft certification and the, the streamlining competing regulations? Uh, 312, we submitted the report to Congress in 2012, as you know, and uh, we've completed, I believe, 10 of the 14 uh, recommendations that, uh, or activities that uh, we put forward with respect to that, and we're focused very much on the others. And Any timeline? Uh, I'll have to get back with you with a specific timeline on that. When can you get back to me? We can get back to you soon. Uh, next week, two next weeks? Week. Next How week. Much? We'll get back to you okay. next week with a report. Thanks, Administrator. Uh, next uh, question uh, that I had uh, regarding AIPs and PFCs, um, mm -hmm. do you have any comments as the agency, have any comment on what the cap should be and is it time to raise uh, passenger facility charge or is, there a time, is it time to tweak the measurements or the, or, the, or the formula or the priorities that we issue AIP monies, especially in the pure discretionary area? The, uh, the administration set forward its proposal in the president's budget, uh, which would raise the PFC from the current cap of $4.50 to $8 
for uh, large airports and at the same time remove the large airports from the formula program. The thought here is that the large airports have the ability to generate significant revenues uh, based on their own activities, but at the same time to preserve uh, the basic access requirements for smaller communities and smaller airports. I yield back. Um, Thank you. Thank you. A couple of notes for the good of the order. There's been a request because of the, uh, the time crunch, and we covered this beginning, but just to make it clear, any members who have questions that there will not be time for, we will submit for the record. And uh, Mr. Huerta, I'm sure your team will help get back to us. Absolutely. And then I'd like to ask unanimous consent in light of the hard stop at 1040, very hard stop at 1040 uh, in consultation with uh, Mr. Larson and Mr. DeFazio and Mr. Schuster that we go to a f hard three-minute questioning. Uh, Mr. Larson, do you like comment? Yeah, you did talk to us about it, Mr. Chairman, and I know it's going to be difficult uh, for members of that, but with the hard stop uh, facing us, uh, we, we accept that. Okay, so without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Carson, you are recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Administrator Werder, thank you, sir. Um, Indiana Airport directors who are, who are here uh, today briefed our delegation this morning about their consensus regarding the need for Congress to raise the cap on passenger facility charges. Now, they're being as creative as they possibly can be to finance the critical infrastructure, as you know, sir, the projects needed across the great Hoosier state. But it's not enough. I think we all know that. Um, first, sir, do you think it's possible, or even realistic for that matter, uh, for local airports to make the infrastructure improvements they need without raising PFCs? And secondly, uh, if you agree that the PFCs need to be raised, how should that be done? What, 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 what does that look like in real terms? And what are your thoughts about any recommendations? Well, our proposal uh, clearly would indicate that we do think it's an appropriate time to raise the PFC uh, for the larger airports in particular. And the proposal to take it from 450 to $8 actually uh, essentially has the effect of adjusting it for inflation from when the last time that the PFC was set. I think that it is important that those airports that have the ability to derive revenues locally uh, do have all of the tools at their disposal, and the PFC is a very, very important tool in that toolbox to enable them to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carson. Mr. Hanna. Thank you. For three minutes. Thank you. There's a theme here today that uh, the FAA is fundamentally behind in everything, right? Mm -hmm. So the question I have for you is, uh, along with Mr. Rokita's uh, comments, um, we are seeing U.S. companies going overseas to test UAVs. Mm -hmm. So um, the question I have is, how can Congress in this next authorization help you deal with that, and what can we do from here to help you be more efficient and perhaps um, lure these companies or keep these companies from moving overseas? I could give you a couple of uh, suggestions with respect to that. The first is, um, as we work through the small... Agree with that, though, excuse me. Uh, do you agree that that's the case? In part, but that's what I'm going to address. The, um, the key thing that I think that uh, we look forward to working with the committee on is the implementation of the small UAS rule, which at, if implemented in the form that we proposed it, would provide the most flexible regulatory environment for small unmanned aircraft anywhere in the world. The second thing is um, Congress provided very significant support for integration in the last authorization. The chairman noted uh, the development of the unmanned aircraft test sites as being key to that. But uh, one of the things, that, and one of the things that we want to use the test sites to focus on is to develop, is to, for testing, the very testing that you're talking about. We have heard, though, from many members of the unmanned aircraft community that since no funds were authorized for appropriation to the test sites, the test sites have turned to the, uh, the testing itself as being the business model through which they support themselves. 
Uh, I've heard a story from one company of uh, being charged a quarter million dollars for a week's testing uh, for a small manufacturer of unmanned aircraft. And so I think providing a supportive framework uh, that enables the test sites to provide low-cost testing resources uh, for companies here in the U.S. would be something that would be very worthwhile. Thank you. I'll yield back. Thank you. Ms. Kirkpatrick. My question has to do with the CTI institutions. In 1912, I mean, excuse me, 2012 and 2013, Arizona State University participated in the FAA diversity study. The survey highlighted the CTI organization's historically diverse alumni, alumni pool. ASU's CTI graduates certify at a rate two times faster than the national average, thereby significant significantly reducing the FAA and the cost to the taxpayers. The FAA's recent change in hiring practice has eliminated employment possibilities for four, over 400 Arizona students and graduates. The nationwide impact is much greater as CTI institutions exist in over 20 states. The students in these classes have made large personal investments based upon published FAA commitments to hire and based upon long-standing practices. So my question is, why make the change now? Why has this change been made? The, the first thing to recognize is that the air traffic controller position is an extremely attractive position. And there will always be more candidates than there are positions. Earlier, I used the example of last year, where we had 28,000 applica applications for only 1,600 positions. And so this is um, a rate that um, is greater than a lot of elite, or that is less than a lot of elite colleges in terms of your ability to get a job. And so the, the CTI uh, program does not provide any degree of anyone having a job, but it is something that the agency takes very seriously. Uh, in this last hire, two-thirds came out of CTI institutions, and so it does recognize that, uh, that what we have in the CTI program is a skill building that enables us to get people through the system. What we're trying to balance and recognize is as the profession changes, we want to ensure that uh, the air traffic controller position is available for the broadest range of qualified candidates so that we can get the best pool, so that we can ensure the most qualified and the safest system that we possibly can have. And my concern really is about the cost to the taxpayers. So I hope you'll factor that in, uh, into that equation as well. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlelady. And with that, Mr. Graves, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I got a lot of questions, but we're obviously not going to get to them. Um, I do have one real quick, and I don't know if you can give me a, a real fast answer on your uh, revised guidance document when it comes to hangar policy. And I got to say, I don't know why, given the limited resources the FAA has, why the FAA is even delving into this. I think it's a local airport authority uh, mm -hmm. issue and, and should be that. Um, but I know you've got a uh, policy that's sitting out there. Is, do you know what the status is right now? I'll check on it this afternoon and get you a response, Congressman. All right. And then the next thing uh, is something that I'm hearing from all over the country. And this concerns me a great deal from a small business standpoint. And that is the change in policy the FAA has come up with when it comes to testing and pilot proficiency, uh, check rides, and restricted use um, aircraft. We've got businesses out there, um, as an example, firefighting. Um, they're authorized to use the aircraft, but now they're no longer authorized to be able to test uh, without an exemption. You've got an exemption process in there, but, but we're hearing that that process can take months. Uh, and this is going to shut down uh, a lot of those businesses. And this is a, a, the process of being able to test or do your tests or, or proficiency uh, check rides uh, in these aircraft is a policy that's been in place for 50 years. And I know the FAA just changed it. And it's, it's serious. Mm -hmm. um, businesses are calling. They're frantic because mm -hmm. they're going to go bankrupt if they can't uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, do their business. And, and I hope we can – this has to be resolved right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a problem. And, again, it goes back to not having enough resources mm -hmm. um, to be able to process these exemptions very, very quickly if there's even an exemption issued. Sure. Let me check on it. Okay. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks. The gentleman knows you can submit all the questions you want for the record. Well, I've uh, got four. And with that, Ms. Norton is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question that I think must trouble, must trouble other members from major metropolitan regions. I notice on page four, you say that you want to make aviation safer and smarter, and I wonder if next gen and what you're doing now, uh, whether that also applies to making planes <laughs> less noisy. There, there are a number of communities um, near the Reagan National uh, Airport um, Fox Hall, Palisades, Georgetown communities, constant uh, issues before next gen, and we've had some next gen here, and with next gen. Later this, this uh, uh, spring, I'm going to be having a community uh, meeting. I am troubled, though, that the community has been meeting with the FAA and with the Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority. And thus far, the questions about noise and noise itself remains uh, and the questions and answered. Uh, it seems to me that it, it would be very important for there to be a collaboration mm -hmm. between FAA and communities, particularly since these communities are now densely populated with real people. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking if you will be available or if FAA will be available to participate if I have a community meeting trying to sort these issues out. I think the FAA, uh, the FAA will certainly work with you to, to address these community concerns and to respond to them. I can give you a couple of things that we are working on, though. As a result of the redesign of the airspace here in the Washington area, we've been working very closely to ensure that flight paths are more precise, that they follow the river, and uh, yeah, that's critical rather than the community. Uh, the river does wind, um, but as a result of technology, we're able to uh, follow it much more precisely. And that is something uh, where we have a very active program with MWA, the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, to ensure that aircraft are in fact following uh, the river going forward. We have a larger initiative that we've undertaken as well, which is really to study the question of uh, the DNL metric. That's the day-night the day average method that is used to as the measure of aircraft noise. This is something that's been around for a very long time. And uh, as a result of just the changes in technology, as well as the evolution of how, where aircraft engines and aircraft airframes have gone, we want to validate and determine do we need to change the metric of how we look at noise and how we measure its impact on communities. This would be very important. Uh, your, um, the FAA's ombudsman has said that there are only three and a half hours when they are per night when there are no flights over these sure. communities. This is just unacceptable. Uh, uh, one more question if I have time. Yeah, well, your time is going to expire, so I ask you to submit it in writing because we have six minutes. I got two members here. Well, let me let those them, members so. speak then. Okay, and you submit it for the record because uh, uh, Mr. Capuano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Administrator. Twelve years ago, I fought to get on this committee, and one of the first things I learned about was next gen. Sounded great to me, safety and improved uh, efficiency. Uh, Twelve years later, and uh, I don't know, about a thousand hearings on next gen, and I don't know, give or take five billion dollars of taxpayer money, and I don't know how much money in private companies, and it's now been implemented in Boston. And I got to be honest, Mr. Administrator, I'm wondering, my support is significantly wavering. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see much change for all the money and effort. And I'm not, this is not laying on you. I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything bad. I think it's good to try something new, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's also good to say maybe it's not worth the money. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of at that point now, I, I, especially I, I'm following up on a question on DCA. As far as Boston goes, I'm told that I can't even intentionally fan planes because, oh, no, we can't do that. Yet in DCA, you can do this. I just mm -hmm. landed that way the other day. Sounded great. See, I understand it. Mm -hmm. But I can't do it anyplace else. That doesn't make sense, especially when we spend all this time and money on a system that should allow you to do very, that exact same thing. I, I, Mr. Mystery, I got to tell you, I, I, I think I, my real basic question is, why should I continue to support throwing money at next gen when I have yet to see an, enough bang for the buck when it comes to decreasing noise, when it comes to increasing safety, when it comes to decreasing delays, or any other things that we had hoped the next gen would support? And I'm not, I want to be clear, I've always been a supporter of next gen. I mm -hmm. kind of still am, but. 
I won't be until we start seeing these sa savings again really quickly. Uh, I haven't seen them, and I, I don't think I'm going to see them in the near future, and I just would like to give you an opportunity to convince me to hang in there. Well, I'd encourage you to hang in there. We are seeing significant benefits all around the country, but I'd like to talk about some of the specific things we're doing in Boston. Uh, Boston Center has been fully upgraded in terms of the new automation platform, the Enroute automation platform, uh, that is really central to the deployment of all of the next-gen benefits that we're talking about. And it's operating and operating very, very well there. Boston Logan Airport is an important test facility for us to test a lot of next-gen related surface operations that greatly increase the efficiency of the airport, reducing departure delays, and also reducing congestion on the ground. We have a great relationship with the Massachusetts Port Authority uh, to try to make the airport operate more efficiently. As we deploy more performance-based navigation procedures um, at Boston and at all the New England airports and throughout the country, uh, what the airlines get is more efficient fuel and more more efficient fuel consumption as uh, well Mr. as... Mr. Minister, I don't mean to interrupt, but and that's all well and good, but why are my complaints going through the roof? Uh, I mean, I've always had complaints about the airport. It's a, congested, it's a congested area, but they're now much more than they have ever been. And honestly, it started when ONAV was implemented. Well, I think it goes back to something that I talked about with Congresswoman Norton. One of the things that we want to understand is, is there a fundamental public shift in its interpretation and understanding of airport noise and how we respond to it. And this is one of the reasons that we want to look at the DNL metric to see, do we have better tools to evaluate uh, noise on a community? When you do, please talk to some of us who have suffered with it, but not just the so-called experts. No, it's actually a national survey uh, that we're doing of communities around airports. Why don't you talk to some people who uh, lived under the some of these time's examples. expired. Thank the gentleman for his question. And with that, the final three minutes goes to Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Warder, thank you. Uh, I'll be very specific. We've had a number of hearings where we've talked about certification process, specifically for general aviation. A number of recommendations made in those hearings. What I want to see from you is specifically three major streamlinings of that process. I'm tired of hearing about it. I'm tired of, of getting testimony and nothing getting done. It needs to go in this reauthorization. I'm committed mm -hmm. to helping you with this reauthorization, but I'm not committed if, if you're not going to do that. Do I have your assurance that you can help us with streamlining the certification process? Um, I think what you're refer referring to is the rewrite of Part 23, which is the provisions that deal with general aviation, where we have worked co collaboratively with industry. We are planning to get a notice of proposed rulemaking out this year on that. Well, can we have your, your thoughts on that before that? Because obviously we've got a reauthorization process that's in the formation process now. I don't want to wait uh, to have that. We need to have that. Can we get that from you? Well, I because we're in a rulemaking process, I can't disseminate what's in the rule, but we can... Well, you're disseminating to other people. No. So, I mean, you're just saying you can't disseminate it to Congress. No that's, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I can't actually publicly put out what is in the rule until it comes out for a notice, but we can certainly share it with you. But you can tell us what your thinking is. We can certainly tell you what the results of the ARC have been, working with industry, and where we, exactly where well, we're Well, we've already heard it. that at hearings, but let me go on further. You talked about gold standards. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, EASA is starting to take over that goal, goal standard if we start to look at internationally in terms of competition. So I want to ask you, what are you personally doing to promote U.S. products internationally? The FAA d cannot actually promote U.S. Well, products. they are. Your competition is. That is true. They have a specific promotional authority. Our promotional authority was removed from us in 1996. And so how we focus on promoting U.S. products is ensuring that we can streamline the process to get the products to market. Well, uh, and so can you uh, submit to this uh, committee three things where you've actually streamlined Regulations, sure. significant. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about just small, but I'm talking about significant streamlining. Have you actually done that? Is that your testimony here today? Yes, it is, and I'd be happy to share examples with you. All right, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Again, I apologize to all the members of the committee for not being able to continue this, and, and Mr. Werder, thank you for being here today. Uh, and I, we thought about re, uh, coming back after the business an hour and a half, and I want to the administrator to go back to the FAA and work on all these things we've been we've been talking about. Um, so, but we appreciate you being here. Uh, members, I'm sure will be submitting questions. I would encourage you to uh, 
uh, get back to us as quick as you can. It would make my life easier when they start uh, pounding on me or why they're not getting responses. But uh, you've been very good at that in the past, and we appreciate that. Uh, again, thank you for being here, and thanks all the members for being here. Uh, and the hearing is adjourned. Thank you.